uh, she was, I think, the last British citizen to be murdered on the orders of German intelligence. That was in December of 2008. Uh, some uh, unhappy news that I sincerely hope was given to the parents when I asked it to be done uh, back in uh, February of this year. Now, and I'll come on to paedophile rings and the kidnap of children for sexual abuse by rings connected with German intelligence uh, uh, later on. Now, Admiral Canaris, the head of German intelligence, was largely responsible for installing Adolf Hitler. It's only in recent years that we've come to an increasing awareness of this in the intelligence communities in Britain, Israel, uh, the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the good guys. Uh, Hitler didn't just march into power in Germany. He was installed, and he was installed by a powerful intelligence network closely connected to German industry. Now, one of the reasons that German industry was so powerful was the discovery by the Germans in the last decades of the 19th century uh, of uh, the potential for leveraging financial instruments and generating substantial offshore off-budget, in the case of Germany, offshore, of course, means Switzerland, or did then, substantial off-books earnings. This is something the Prime Minister has referred to recently elliptically, because he's not in a position to go public on it, but elliptically referred to as off-books banking. All major banks in the world conduct most of their activities off their balance sheets. And the German defence budget prior to 1914 was as much a phony as the Chinese defence budget is now, or the Soviet budget was in the Cold War. Uh, the German naval expansion was largely funded out of the German, not out of the German exchequer. And companies like Krupp's would put up, let us say, uh, uh, 100 million marks, and that sum would be leveraged by banks up to, say, a billion marks. And they would be rigged trading in discounted financial instruments provided by the United States. Uh, for example, discounted medium-term notes and the exits and entries into these trades would be fixed in advance so that you would know your profit. There would be no risk for the bank and a company like Krupp's would effectively be increasing its profits by tenfold. Now these are complex transactions they're very dangerous. Um, they are the main reason why we've had uh, inflation post-45, because they have substantially increased the money supply in Britain and America. There's no such thing as a free lunch. German control of the Federal Reserve was largely responsible for the supply of discounted medium-term notes, which are normally dollar notes. And these discounted notes uh, were largely responsible for, or rather the, the, the trading was largely responsible for the collapse of the German currency in 1922-23. What the maniacs were doing uh, was excessive high yield trading, it goes under a variety of terms, private placements of capital, trading programs, but e excessive high yield trading, flooding Germany with cash in a desperate attempt to rebuild the German military, rebuild the German economy after World War I. So they paid for World War I with instruments largely backed by gold. Uh, in 1918, they lost control of a lot of their gold supply, and they actually moved off gold to currency, uh, immediately destroyed or debased their currency. Uh, and then uh, uh, had to fight a fairly long way back to some sort of economic stability. At the same time, of course, they caused huge economic stability for Britain and America because we now know Germany sponsored the Great Depression, uh, just as they've sponsored the credit crunch. Uh, all the problems of the credit crunch go back to German banks or German-controlled banks or banks with German shareholders or Saudi shareholders in bed with the Germans. Uh, the Germans have always understood the importance of controlling other countries' central banks, and we know they set up, effectively set up the Federal Reserve from 1913 uh, and we know, we know about the meetings in North Carolina, for example, the Jekyll Island meetings, the um, close connections between the head of German intelligence um, and key bankers in the United States. Uh, Max Warburg is the head of German intelligence, connected to the uh, Warburg banking family. And we know about German control of the Bank of England. Uh, the Germans took control of the Bank of England 
uh, by getting Lloyd George to back the appointment of a German spy called Montague Norman. Um, now, he was discovered in 45, or at least it was appreciated by 45 that he was working for the Germans, uh, but nothing uh, was done about that. Uh, there are fascinating historical sidelines to the German control of central banks. Uh, uh, you've got large, you know, we've got central bankers in recent years appearing dead face down in their swimming pools, like when Duisenberg was one of the most recent central bankers to be murdered by German intelligence. Um, the whole Titanic episode was all to do with eliminating bankers who were opposed to Germany's plan to set up the Federal Reserve. And, of course, the Titanic was owned by a German banker, and, uh, or rather the shipping line was owned by a German banker, J.P. Morgan, who was a German-American, reported to German intelligence. J.P. Morgan was at the Jekyll Island meeting with Max Warburg, the head of German intelligence, and uh, Morgan and Warburg worked closely together, and uh, 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 Morgan was supposed to sail on the Titanic and didn't. Claimed he was ill, he wasn't. He was, in fact, with his mistress in the south of France, uh, and that whole thing was set up. If you want to know more about that, ask me a question. Uh, we could spend half an hour talking about the Titanic. World War I was, to some extent, a farce at the end because of the failure to appreciate that German intelligence was carrying on. Uh, we let them, for example, organize Spanish flu. Spanish flu, we now know, is a WMD. Uh, it was coincided, it was released to coincide with Ludendorff's spring offensive, and it was aimed at young men of military age. And it was based on German medical discoveries at the end of the 19th century, uh, whereby the Germans were able to trigger an overreaction of the immune system. Spanish flu killed uh, by, yeah, the reason it targeted young men of military age is because it was designed to trigger an overreaction of the human immune system, and it was the body's own immune systems that killed the victims of Spanish flu, largely. Not exclusively, but largely. Um, and all the variants of Spanish flu, including the most recent one, uh, which we've uh, been dealing with, swine flu, which is also a, a, a WMD, are all linked back to the original Spanish flu and all work on the same principle, attacking young, fit people with the strongest immune system because the people with the strongest immune system um, are the most vulnerable. Uh, we didn't do anything to stop that between 1918 and 1921. Uh, I was partly responsible for the exposure of Spanish flu. Uh, it was all to do with uh, discovery of Spanish flu strains in, uh, that had been moved out of Iraq in 2003. And I had theorized there were probably some bodies from 1918 with a live copy of the virus. Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta wanted everybody, the army pathology people in, in uh, Virginia, the, the guys in CDC in Atlanta, all wanted Porton down, all wanted live copies of the virus to check my theories. I said, let's go find a live copy of the virus. Michael, it was 1918, you know, the last person to die of Spanish flu, you know, popped his clogs in about 1921. And I said, ask the Russians, they've probably got somebody buried deep in the permafrost. Um, because the virus will survive many decades um, in, in very cold conditions. Um, in, at the end, because the, the CDC and the CIA won't really trust the Russians, uh, we ended up digging up some, mes some Eskimos from <laughs> in Alaska. I got a very, a very chilly response from some poor major, I think it was a pathologist in the US Army. I, I, I got a, a complaint passed back to me about <laughs> a very, very chilly few weeks spent up in Alaska in the permafrost uh, rescuing these poor Eskimos. There were three of them, I think. And eventually we got hold of live copies of the virus and verified that Spanish flu uh, was a WMD. Um, just re only early this year, I was involved in briefings uh, for uh, various governments on the Spanish on the uh, 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 swine flu, uh, including a briefing for the Mexicans, because the swine flu had been released in Mexico uh, because the, German, the Mexican government uh, had started cracking down on a German-controlled <coughs> cocaine cartel. And the next thing you know, we had this bug appearing, and I explained to the Mexicans it was a German bug. How do you know it was a German bug? Well, there are various means of examining German bugs. One is you put them under the microscope and see if they've got a coal scuttle helmet and a goose stepping. <laughs> if they're giving each other Hitler salutes, uh, singing the horse vessel song, and they, the bugs have all got coal scuttle helmets and they're goose stepping in, in unison, then that's normally a sign that they're German bugs. But take it from me, if the bug had got a coal scuttle helmet on and was goose stepping, uh, the signs that it was a German bug could not have been any clearer. Important Dan know all this, of course. Uh, uh, but are keeping quiet as our CDC for fear of upsetting the Germans. Now, we did the, made the same mistake in 45 as we made in 1918. We did not shut down their intelligence. We did not know who was running their intelligence. Stupidly, we bought into the theory that... Uh,